I feel like renting for the rest of my life is probably what I'm looking at. It works for some people, doesn't work for others. If I can make a property my own home, well then I don't need to essentially go out and buy one. Would you be happy to rent your whole life? What if you could rent the same property for 5, 10, 15 years or more? Welcome to Real Talk, realestate.com.au's property news podcast. It's real questions, real experts and real insights. And today we're going to be talking about what long-term renting could look like because with housing affordability at its lowest level in 30 years, renting actually could be the reality for not only the 30% of Aussies who currently rent, but for the generations to come. We'll be talking about what we can learn from overseas rental markets and the state of the market for long-term rentals. We spoke to some everyday Aussies about how they feel about being lifelong renters. I think I would be happy to rent for the rest of my life. I think people are judged all the time for just renting. I think that's the biggest reason I want to buy is because I want to, I want to be able to uh, renovate, I want to be able to make the home my home. Would I be happy to rent my whole life? No. I know in Europe it's very popular to rent. Most people in Europe rent because it's so expensive over there. I suppose as Australia's population increases, it's going to be harder for people to buy and own homes. I think it's probably the general standard that most people rent and it won't be judged. I like quite being quite free and bouncing around quite a bit. If you look on Instagram, everyone's just posting, oh, we've got a house as if it's like one big trophy. But for me personally, I don't, I don't really care. Joining me to unpack it is Jared Scott, the General Manager of Product at realestate.com.au, and Christian Graham, Head of Home, with 25 years' experience in the property industry, pioneering the build-to-rent market. Thanks, guys, for joining me today. With PropTrack data showing that rental vacancy rates are at 1.1% nationally as of August 2023, the rental crisis is something that we need to be talking about, but not so much from the doom and gloom angle that we often hear about it, but from the perspective of how can we actually fix this. Jared, can you tell me of a country that is a gold class example for a great rental experience? We absolutely could learn a lot from Europe. If you look at the percentage of individuals that choose to rent in a country like Germany, we're looking at almost half of the population. And not only are they renting at a certain stage of their life, they're choosing to rent for a longer period of time as well. Absolutely, there's some observations from Europe, how that they incentivize landlords and property owners to participate in renting that I think would apply very well in Australia. The other market that's interesting is the US. You look at some of the multi-home incentives that exist for developers there. I think there's a lot that could be learned through other parts of the world. We're starting to see emergence of build to rent in the UK, which follows a a similar model. And that's now coming to Australia as well, which I think presents an exciting option for renters to start thinking about longer term commitment and, and the possibility of renting for more of their lives. It's pretty much everywhere else in the world does it really well, except for Australia. Christian, is there any global inspiration from your end to help us reimagine our own renter experience? We really took inspiration from the US where uh, the build to rent sector or multifamily, as they call it over there, is very, very well established. It's been there for decades, but certainly from the 90s onwards, we see a huge prevalence of different types of rental products, some at the more affordable end, some at the ultra premium end, high service, low service but all really geared around a great rental experience. We took inspiration from that about five years ago. We saw that the rental experience in Australia was fairly crummy and there was room for uh, a better product, better experience to be bought to Australia. And so we set about doing that for an Australian customer and an Australian lifestyle. And I think that's really important to note because I'm a firm believer that you can't just look to something of an overseas market and go, all right, let's just replicate that here in Australia because it's not going to work. Our lifestyles are different. The way we live is different, but actually the way we want to live is different. There's almost a psychological element to it. Jared, what actually does the rental experience look like here? Fundamentally, most of the rental stock in the country is owned by mum and dad investors. 82% of all rentals are owned by private individuals who essentially are using it for wealth creation. It's a very different need to the renters who are looking for housing. Those two incentives are not always aligned. And so that's why there's the need for things like leasing agreements to be in place that help outline the terms and conditions of occupancy in a home and help both the tenant and the owner have confidence that it's going to be a successful arrangement. For the vast majority of leases, about 90% 
the initial leasing term is 12 months. That first year is really a getting to know you window. It's sussing each other out, making sure that the rent gets paid consistently and on time, making sure that if there's maintenance requests, there's a response and there's action. Do we ever normally see more than a 12-month lease, Jared, or just as a standard across the market, that's what it is? It's fairly rare to see more than 12 months. We do support the rental application workflow as part of our realestate.com.au offering. And in 10% of applications, we do see a request for a two-year lease. The reality is most property managers are very reluctant to offer an initial two-year length because of all of those reasons we just talked about. There's a desire to, to make sure that the tenant's the right fit, the rent will be paid consistently, that there's no issues with pets or maintenance. So it is very uncommon for an initial lease to be more than 12 months. That said, the government has worked hard to increase the incentives and the legislation around those longer-term leasing options. There are now two-year five year and beyond leases available. So it is a choice that consumers can explore if the owner or the property manager are willing. In our experience though, there's very low desire on both sides at this point. So thinking back to the German model, how would we create those incentives? How would we create the right structure to provide a little bit more certainty and a little bit more predictability in that experience so that more people were willing to go down that path earlier in their rental journey? Do you have any insight on who those people are that are asking for two years? It's a mixed bag. We see the demand from all corners of the community. Sometimes it's younger demographics and it's all about the location. We're seeing a a changing demographic on our rental application platform. Um, You know, we've had months where almost 10% of our applicants were over the age of 65. That is not the vision we have in mind or the image we have in mind of of what an Australian rental looks like. No, I'm shocked. There are changes and yes, some of that will be downsizing or some of that will be transitory while properties are are turning over or transacting, but equally the need to rent later in your life is growing. And so there's also segments of those communities and, and those consumers that are also looking for some predictability and stability. And for them, it's about being close to amenity, close to work, close to family and friends. Generally, when people are on a 12-month lease and say it ticks over to another 12-month lease, there is an incremental rental increase if a a renter locks in a lease for three years. Does that actually halt the ability to increase their rent? Yes. There there are provisions that can be written into the, the leasing document about how to manage rent growth. And, you know, we hear common examples of it's 5% per year Mm. or CPI, whichever is, is higher or lower. There's negotiations possible around some of those things. At the end of the day, though, in a marketplace that's supply constrained, demand is very high. Mm. We see anywhere between 30 and 40 applicants per property. It means that the consumer or the, the tenant entering that agreement doesn't have a lot of leeway. They don't have a lot of bargaining or negotiation power. Basically, the basis are loaded for the owner. They have an incentive to transact and turn over that property yeah, over course. a period of time because, yeah. they, you know, if you look at the last three years, the the, the rent growth has been phenomenal, oh, almost 32% for homes, yeah. um, 23% for apartments. Because of that desire to, to use your, your investment property as wealth creation, they want to be able to take advantage of those economics and that's why the, the system does incentivize these shorter term leases over longer term leases. A renter could potentially need to move home every 12 months. And while that can offer the renter flexibility, it actually also brings a lot of instability and uh, worry and stress, like especially for families. Christian, your company specialises in build to rent. Can you actually talk about what the concept of build to rent is? Apartment buildings or communities that are designed specifically for the renter. So we select the sites, we then go and work with the best architects and the best builders to create buildings specifically for the rental experience. And then we run and and hold those buildings for the long term. I guess what's different to conventional renting is our whole mindset is focused on the customer experience. So we are completely aligned with each of our residents. We want them to stay. We want the community to be happy. And so we put a lot of focus on that. The building developer is the landlord. Yeah. Development's such a small part of it. Developing is just getting the building built. Yeah. That maybe takes a couple of years, but then we're looking to hold it for 10 years. So we developed the building because we, we need to, because we want a very specific product for a renter. 
But in the end, it's all about running that building and creating community for the long term. What does long term mean? Like how long can the lease period be? Yeah, anyone that walks through our doors can rent for, we say, anything from six months to six years. But there's absolutely no reason why that couldn't be 10 years. Wow. We do write in the fixed increases so that people have absolute clarity about what those increases will be from year to year. And in the current environment, that's way less than inflation. So I think that's fair peace of mind when I compare that to, you know, just following what happens with interest rates as a, as a homeowner. Yeah, you can lock those increases in now for, for, you know, as long as that lease is. We have a lot of people that will come into our buildings. They want to try it out. It's a new concept. They might sign up for a six-month lease initially and they get to know it and they like it and then they can sign on for a longer period after. We'll also move you from apartment to apartment. So before you came in, you thought you needed a two-bedroom. You've worked out that the co-working spaces and all the other amenities mean you didn't need such a big apartment. You want to shift to a one or you have a kid and you want to shift up to a three. We'll work with you and shift you shift you around to, to suit what's happening in your life at that point in time too. That's amazing. And I think those fixed rental increases, what they do allow for renters is to forecast for budget and forecast for how much their outgoings are versus how much their savings can be. Whereas with traditional leasing in this country, you actually don't know what your rental increase is going to be until you get an email from your landlord and saying, do you accept or not? But what this security feels like to me is it kind of feel like, feels like the modelling that's used in Italy where they have a couple of different types of contracts. Some are for transitory stays, so they're up to about 18 months. Then they have a thing called a 3-2 contract, which is a three-year lease that then can be renewed for an additional two years. But then they also have a 4-4 contract, which is a lease that's for four years. And then after that four years, you can choose to extend it for another four years. Build to rent feels like a little bit of a property buzzword at the moment. It is a brand new concept to Australia anyway. It's only been here a couple of years. But Christian, where did it start and what has the success overseas looked like? The US is really the, a lot of people think of that as the home of build to rent because their post-war housing, a lot of that was conceived as rental, but really from the 90s onwards, it really exploded over there. The UK is maybe the more recent example where it's really only been around for about a decade over there. It learned from the US and then it adapted to a UK customer and then came to Australia in about 2018. So really only five years old here. Most of what you see on the ground in Australia, what we call the first generation, tend to be very high service and high amenities. Why has it taken so long then to get off the ground here in Australia? Actually, a lot's happened in that five years that it's been on the ground. It's followed the trajectory of the UK and is looking to be just as big in Australia as it as it's become in the UK over the last decade. I think it needed groups like ourselves at home to have brought that Northern Hemisphere concept to Australia, get it right for an Australian audience, and then for others to be able to see it. Now, maybe the biggest challenge at the moment is it's new and the only way to really wrap your head around it is to come and see it to come and uh, walk through these buildings to understand that all this stuff is really on offer and all this stuff is really focused on the resident or the renter. Well, we did speak to one person about their thoughts on what it would mean to rent long term for them. The idea of a long term rental, ideally with like some kind of rent control involved in it, so you're not getting that hike every year would be amazing. Just knowing that you can settle in and make it your home and it's not just every 12 months having to look to relocate, which could be stressful. Don't think there's enough laws protecting renters' rights at the moment. There's such low availability that tenants are feeling like they just have to do whatever they're told to not rock the boat. I think there is absolutely judgment about people who choose to rent. I think there's an assumption that there's definitely a class divide. If you're not trying to buy, why not? Why don't you want that stability? But I think low acknowledgement that it's just not going to be an option for so many people. I do love this concept. Christian, do you think that something like build to rent and long-term renting has the ability to change the landscape of renting in this country, well, essentially forever? I think we're past the point of proof of concept. I tend not to think of it as an either or about home ownership or rental, but I do think it absolutely has now cemented itself as another choice for, for renters. Are we going to have enough supply for this type of concept? I wish I could be more optimistic, but I think I think Australia's got a dire um, undersupply of, of housing for ownership and for rental. Yes, it certainly does. I, I think um, build to rent is by far and away the lowest hanging flute for us in terms of 
being able to generate high volumes of high quality, it's going to do a lot of the heavy lifting. But I think governments at all levels are still going to have quite a lot to do to increase housing supply across Australia. So, Jared, you mentioned before that there is not a lot of incentive for the traditional type of landlord to give longer term leasing. And if we are going to see perhaps the build to rent market not struggling to find supply, but Australia as a whole is struggling to find supply. What more do you think can be done to those traditional landlords, as they stand, those mum and dad investors, to increase the rental terms? I think built to rent is really satisfying a, a very much needed consumer problem or renter problem. Interestingly, when we talk to tenants, 14% of them tell us they plan to be in that property for more than 10 years. So they are very, very keen to stay in, in the properties they're in. I think there is a, a desire and an appetite for that longer term commitment on the tenant side. I think the challenges mostly exist with the owner and that that fear of commitment because they want the financial flexibility, the financial freedom to to do what they can to optimise the, the asset as they think about it. And again, it goes back to those incentives being completely different between creating money, creating wealth and providing a housing solution. So I think for owners, the, the opportunity is to be open-minded if you have got a good tenant about the possibility of negotiating a longer term lease and talking through what that could look like from a, a rent affordability and rent payment expectation point of view and things like maintenance. You know, that's an area that Germany does really well. They have provisions in their leasing agreements where the tenant must maintain the property to certain standards and that can include renovating. So the tenant really does feel like it's their property to make their home and they can, you know, have a little bit of that flexibility and expression on the place, which you know, does change that dynamic significantly. In Singapore, uh, the market there is that somebody can get a lease for five years or more um, with the guidelines on a maximum increase over that duration. So it is similar to the build to rent model we've been speaking about where they're able to forecast what their incremental rent increases will be. And I actually think that provides people with a lot more security. But I want to move on to our cultural perception around renting. Christian, why do you think Australians put so much emphasis on buying the great Australian dream? I think it's cultural. Australia is built on immigration. Just the human psychology of arriving in a new place and wanting to have stability has meant that people see home ownership as stability. And then uh, on top of that, they see it as uh, the best avenue for wealth creation because our tax settings have um, enabled all of that. And dare I say it, because build to rent didn't exist before. Um, and that's probably the truth of it, actually, that there really wasn't a good long-term rental option. How do these buildings cater to families? All our buildings have three-bedroom apartment options in them. We have considered things like putting in uh, like, like a kid's play area or kid's playroom. You see that a lot in the US and a little bit in the UK. Australia is still really at a point where families seeing apartments as a living option, maybe a little more in Sydney than Melbourne, but... Family seeing apartments as an option is still something that's relatively new um, and maybe the buildings haven't suited yet. So it's something that we have an eye to. It's still a fairly small proportion of the market that we see. But then we, we see just taking the family thing and just, and just looking at it slightly differently, we'll have uh, an empty nester that will move in and then they'll all take an apartment or they'll encourage their kids to come into the same building so that they're close by or if they've got a first grandchild. So you see families, but just in a different version sometimes in our buildings as well. Do you think that we'll see a surge in build to rent projects given all of these inflationary costs? We will definitely see an increase in demand for not just housing solutions, but lifestyle solutions. I think that's really the, the key differentiator for, for build to rent. It's providing not just a housing option, but your gym, your, your vehicle and transport and amenity access. There's a lot that, that gets included in that, that lifestyle that is very valuable to, to the consumer. They understand the value of finding a great property and a great lifestyle solution in a great area. And so I think we will see an increasing acceptance that you know these models have a lot of merit. They offer long-term stability and they offer the best chance to really enjoy the, the most of that suburb to make the most of your lifestyle in certain areas. I think it's a great point, Jared. I just want to think about somewhere like Sydney, which is a which is geographically a very challenging place because of the harbour and the, the waterways um, and its own density. And it has things like the new metro stations that it will that will come into Sydney over the next 
five to 10 years, I would like to think that you'll see build to rent buildings very close to those metro stations, because if you don't, it's going to be very hard to be a renter and to be near that new transport infrastructure, which is once in a several generation opportunity. And it will be all crowded out by homeowners with no opportunity for renters to have the convenience of that lifestyle of the quicker transit, transit and commute to work and so forth. And so I, I would like to think that, that BTR plays a role in that um, in Sydney in particular. There's such a psychological element to this in that proof of concept, it's a no-brainer. It works. It's great. Everything we've spoken about today, but it's that element of I need to own my own patch of land. Generations to come won't be able to afford to. And there's going to be a scarcity of land. So it's almost like the the only barrier is people's mindsets. On that, Christian, what would you say to people who are hesitant about renting as a long-term housing solution? I'm smiling as you ask that point because what generally happens is whenever I, whenever we take someone through our buildings, they walk through and they go, I could live here. Old people, young people, people with kids. So, the, so the, what I would say is this is new, this is different. You've got to come and experience it. So book a tour, come and walk through it and experience it for yourself. You'll never quite understand it until you do because it's a completely new choice for renters. Somebody could live in that building with without any risk, I guess, of being kicked out because it's not going to be sold from under your feet. As somebody who rents, that is in the back of your mind. How long will I be able to be here? Not necessarily because you like or you dislike it, but because your landlord might sell for whatever reason. So if you are moving into, say, a build to rent or a long-term renting solution, I think half the battle is understanding that this is mine for however long I want it, for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. That is the barrier, in my opinion, being able to stay. That is the thing. So Jared, what are your thoughts on to people who are hesitant about that long-term renting solution? A lot has changed in our rental marketplace in the last five years. We've had COVID, we've had severe supply and demand imbalances. We've got changing property needs that have accelerated quickly. Unfortunately, the reality is it's going to get worse before it gets better when it comes to rental affordability and rental supply. The unfortunate reality and what's ahead for renters is not always going to feel comfortable and there's not always going to be great choices. The mindset shift, I actually think it's already happening. Uh, unfortunately, it's been driven by the pain of today's rental market, not a realisation of what this could represent from, from a value and a lifestyle point of view. I think as that momentum grows, as we see you know, more projects come to market, more people really embracing this choice, I think it's, there's a lot that we can learn from for our future planning and, and housing solutions, but also a lot of consumer awareness that, that will come from seeing these projects in action. Look, I don't think we've solved the issue of lifelong renters, but there is movement from a regulation perspective and investment perspective from developers in that build to rent space. Will it change enough to shift the cultural value of a home ownership? We're not quite sure, like it's happening, but at, at what pace? We have run out of time. But this has been an awesome episode. Thank you so much for joining me. I've learned loads, so I hope our listeners have, and I hope you guys have had fun too. Thanks, Thanks Alice. Thank you. Thank you.